Welcome everyone to our first webinar, How and Why We Get SIBO, Understanding the Root Cause. So I'm going to start with the first slide. And I want to draw your attention to the incredible increase in the number of scientific papers on the microbiome. If you look at the last few years, and this graph stops at 2014, but you see that there's this, been this incredible increase in the number of articles on the microbiome. I remember a few years ago where there'd be a new article maybe once or twice a week. Now there's several new articles every day. So this is, an, this is just a science that's exploding. And I feel like literally every day we learn something new about the microbiome and the relevance to health and disease and so on. So very excited to have you join us and to be able to share what I have, the knowledge that I've really gained in the last several years taking care of patients with microbial damage. What I want to spend a moment on is this concept of terrain, which may be a new concept for some of you. And as I explained in the ebook, our old idea of how we get disease really has to do with Louis Pasteur's germ theory. And this is the idea that we get sick because we have the misfortune of coming into contact with a virulent organism. So it's really all about the virulence of the organism that gets into our body and makes us sick. And this concept assumes that we all have essentially equal susceptibility to disease and that the determining factor is the virulence of the organism. This is really in, in stark opposition to the concept of terrain, which really says that, yes, some things are very virulent, smallpox or a bull or so on. But in general, when we think of most of the things that make the majority of us sick, which is a viral infection that can cause an upper, upper respiratory tract infection, or E. coli that might cause a bladder infection or something that might cause a sinus infection, that it has less to do with the virulence of the organism and more to do with the health of the host as opposed to the virulence of the pathogen, the host being us. And it really has to do with how healthy our gastrointestinal soil is, our terrain, because our gut flora really dictate our, the health of our immune system in terms of susceptibility. So this idea that if we have a healthy gut garden, if you will, if our soil, if our terrain is healthy, then we can crowd out and neutralize and sort of take care of pathogens that might come our way versus if we don't have a healthy terrain and then we're sick all the time. And I think this point is well borne out in one of the case studies we're going to talk about in a minute. So it's very important, whether you're a patient yourself or you're a healthcare professional seeing clients, that when you look at the patient with SIBO, you're not just looking at what's going on now in isolation, but you're really connecting the dots with what this person's terrain looks like, including going way, way back. Was this, baby, was this person born by a C-section or was this a vaginal delivery? Were they nursed and for how long? For a good 18 months or two years? Or were they bottle fed with some soy-based formula right from birth? Did their mother receive antibiotics for group B strep during pregnancy? Were they in the NICU, in the neonatal intensive care unit, as a baby receiving antibiotics? What was their life like as a toddler? Were they sick all the time? I always ask about tonsillectomy because kids who have their tonsils and or adenoids out, that usually comes after several courses of antibiotics. It's very unusual that a doctor would take out a kid's tonsils the first time they have strep. So if you yourself have had a tonsillectomy or your client, your patient has had a tonsillectomy, that's generally a marker for a kid that's had a lot of pharyngitis, a lot of strep, et cetera, during childhood. What about what they ate? Were they a picky eater eating you know, chicken tenders and tater tots? Or did they eat vegetables? Did they receive prolonged antibiotics as young adults? So I always ask about acne. People often don't think about the drugs they receive for acne, like tetracycline or minocycline, as courses of antibiotics, but of course they are. So people often forget about that, and you have to jog their memory. So you want to ask about antibiotics that may have been received as a teenager or young adult, or if you yourself have taken antibiotics if you're a patient. You have to think about drugs that you're on that can dramatically affect your terrain. And of course, number one on the list is antibiotics, but a close second are acid suppressing drugs, primarily proton pump inhibitors, the little purple pill like Nexium and others. And in one of the articles I included in your package, which was an article from the journal Gut, 
from 2015. And that article talked about the changes that we can see in the bacterial taxa and the dramatic changes in patients who are on proton pump inhibitors on acid suppression with up to 20% of the bacterial taxa in the gut changed by these drugs. And generally what we see is overrepresentation of mouth bacteria in the stool. So as you know from your packet, as you go from north to south in the GI tract, from the mouth to the anus, the type of bacteria change, but also the numbers of bacteria change, and the numbers increase quite dramatically as you go from the mouth down to the bottom of the colon. And so what we see in people who've been on acid suppression is we see a lot of bacteria in the upper GI tract, sort of a classic sign of SIBO, of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, where we see much higher numbers of bacteria in the upper tract, in the small intestine, and even in the stomach. And again, the kinds of bacteria that are represented are different. So the, the people who did that study in 2015 concluded that long-term acid suppression use with these drugs, these proton pump inhibitors, was as bad as long-term antibiotic use, which the general public is generally very unaware of. So that's a very important aspect of determining if somebody has SIBO and how you're going to approach a SIBO and how you're going to get rid of this in the long term is to look at all these other factors. So look at medication use. Look at steroids, not just oral steroids that people might take in the form of a pill like prednisone, but inhaled steroids like Flonase and some of these inhalers that people use. Those drugs are also absorbed systemically and can have a systemic effect and can increase the likelihood of somebody having issues with chronic SIBO. So very important to think about all those different factors when you are thinking about what someone's terrain is and the likelihood of them ending up with SIBO as a chronic problem. While we're on the subject, I want to just say a word about the term SIBO. As I emphasized in the packet of information you got, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is somewhat of a misnomer because it's really about bacterial imbalance. And when you call it overgrowth, it becomes very tempting, low-hanging fruit to think, oh, if I have bacterial overgrowth, I'm just going to use something, an antibiotic perhaps, and get rid of all this extra bacteria and then I'll be fine. But as we'll find out in part three where we talk about treatment, rifaximin, or as you might know it, zyfaxin, which is a poorly absorbed antibiotic that is often used to treat SIBO, is a really bad idea for a number of reasons, but primarily because in addition to eradicating any extra bacteria in the small intestine, it also affects the healthy bacteria in the gut that help to support our immune system and keep us healthy. So people often feel better for a week or two after the zyfaxin, and then they typically start to feel worse as they get regrowth, and they're now sort of in a deeper hole. But again, we'll get into details with the, in that with the third webinar, I want to really focus on diagnosis and, and uh, the concept of terrain for this one. So the gastrointestinal soil, which is really the background noise on which the SIBO sits, is crucially important both prognostically in trying to figure out is this person going to have an easily fixable case of SIBO or is there some chronicity to this and are there some additional factors that really need to be identified and remediated for this to really improve. And this brings me to the concept of pathobionts, which I also went over in the packet, but it's a very important concept. We think about pathogens, again, Ebola, smallpox, things that are not typically in our bodies or on our bodies somehow get into our bodies, whether it's through a wound or through the mouth or however, something that's airborne, and it makes us sick as a pathogen. And we think of a symbiont as an organism, a bacteria, a fungal organism, a virus that lives in our body in a sort of commensal way, meaning it typically is not causing problems. Sometimes it's of benefit to the host, sometimes not, but generally something that is not creating disease. And so a pathobiont really refers to when symbionts are overrepresented in a way. So organisms that under normal circumstances would not be causing disease but when they're either overrepresented or maybe geographically in a part of the body where they shouldn't be, or really the ratio is off, now they can create illness, often in the form of inflammation. So this concept of pathobionts 
is really crucial for understanding SIBO because it's not large amounts of bad bacteria in the body. It often is the commensal bacteria that are now overrepresented in the small intestine or the ratios of proportion is off. So yeast overgrowth is a great example of a pathobiont. We actually need yeast to digest food and to perform multiple other functions in the body. Yeast are sort of given a bad rap. But yeast are a critical part of our ecosystem. But when they're overrepresented, as happens in the mouth or in the vagina or in the GI tract, after a course of antibiotics, we now have what we call a yeast infection, but which is really yeast overgrowth. So a vaginal yeast overgrowth after antibiotics is a classic example of a form of dysbiosis of altered gut bacteria. It's technically not SIBO because it's not happening in the small intestine, but many, many people who have SIBO will also have yeast overgrowth in other parts of the body. If you're a woman, it could be vaginally. If you're a man, it could be jock itch. It could be fungal infections in the nail area, in the feet and hands. It can be oral thrush in the mouth. It can be a yeasty rash in the airs or on the scalp or onto the breast. So this is a frequent accompaniment to SIBO. And again, part of this whole process of dysbiosis, of alterations in the balance of organisms within the ecosystem of the microbiome. The other thing I want to point out is a multifactorial role in many of these different factors. So it is frequently not just one thing. It's often not just that somebody takes a course of antibiotics and they get SIBO. It again is often this is somebody who was a C-section baby, bottle fed, picky eater, tonsils out, antibiotics for acne in college, maybe a couple extensive courses of antibiotics for Lyme disease, frequent sinus infections, or one that I see a lot, women who are taking prophylactic, that is preventive antibiotics before intercourse to prevent urinary tract infections. And when we add it all up, they've had you know, 60 courses of antibiotics over the course of a few years each time just a pill or two each time, but each time still having consequences on the microbiome. And then maybe somebody who's been taking Prilosec or Omeprazole, Nexium, any one of these Prevacid, Protonics, any one of these proton pump inhibitor acid suppressing drugs for a few years. <clears throat> and maybe they've also been on birth control pills, et cetera. And then there is one inciting event. Maybe they're in Mexico and they get traveler's diarrhea and they're also treated with antibiotics for that and things just end up going haywire and never returning to normal. <clears throat> or perhaps it's a prolonged course of antibiotics for something. So the sort of straw that breaks the camel's back, if you will, can often be an infectious event, viral, bacterial, fungal even, or it can be a course of medication that changes things. But frequently, that person has lots of other risk factors for SIBO, and then there's this one event. So. Let's go to the next slide, and we'll talk about categories for SIBO. And this is a helpful way to think about the different causes. And this is where that dysbiosis checklist comes in. It's not really meant to be some sort of scientific mathematical algorithm of, you know, if you have this number of factors, then the SIBO is this bad. That would, uh, we don't have those tools at the moment to quantify things. But it's really meant as a checklist for you, if you're a patient dealing with SIBO, to look at and to think about and to really try to identify what factors can be remediated. Or if you're dealing with patients, when you're taking a history, to really think about all the different things that can contribute and to cast a broad net when you're asking your patients about risk factors. So I like to divide it up into these four categories, anatomical, pharmaceutical, dietary, and lifestyle. And of course there are others, but these are four big ones. <clears throat> so if we start with anatomical, we think about how the normal anatomy of the GI tract may be altered surgically. Somebody may have had obesity surgery, some form of bariatric surgery, like a Rouen-Y anastomosis, or some other alteration where a part of the intestinal tract is either removed or diverted in an effort to decrease absorption of calories, which of course is incredibly disruptive to the microbiome and not in a good way. So there are anatomical reasons like that. If somebody has had uh, part of their 
been test and resected. Maybe they've had a part of the colon removed for colon cancer. Maybe they have had something that is not part of the digestive tract but has caused scarring and slow motility. So they might have had a hysterectomy or even their gallbladder taken out. And now there's some scar tissue there and there's some impingement on the normal peristaltic movement of the intestinal tract. And that has slowed down the traffic on the digestive superhighway, if you will. So now we have a backup. We have stasis and stasis can often equal SIBO, slow movement through the digestive tract. So anatomical considerations, if you look at a condition like Crohn's disease, where there may be resections, particularly in the small bowel and the ileum, but even when they're not resections, there's fibrosis and scarring, and that leads to slowing down of the intestinal contents. Diabetes is another condition where because of damage to the nerves from diabetes, there can be slow movement through the GI tract. Uh, patients who have cystic fibrosis have abnormal motility. Patients who have rheumatologic conditions like lupus or Sjogren's can have it. People who have neurologic conditions like Parkinson's and MS. So there are lots of secondary causes that will create anatomical variances, not necessarily parts of the anatomy that have been removed, but the way that these secondary conditions can affect the motility, either through nerve damage or through scarring and fibrosis, et cetera, can affect the physiology and movement through the GI tract. So anatomical considerations. Keep in mind also that women, I refer to it as a voluptuous venous colon. Women have colons that are on average about six centimeters longer than the male colon. Six centimeters may not seem like a lot, but it can lead to an, a lot of extra redundancy, particularly in the sigmoid colon. A lot more twists and turns and can lead to slower transit through the digestive tract for the products of digestion. Women also tend to have, um, well, women do have lower testosterone levels and that often means an abdominal wall that is not as firm. And so women tend to have more looping of the bowels because if you will, their Spanx is a little bit stretched out because the abdominal wall is not as tight because of lower levels of testosterone. And that's true even for women who work out. The testosterone gives men an advantage in terms of a more rigid abdominal wall. And the third reason is that women, of course, have more going on anatomically in the pelvic area because we have a uterus, we have fallopian tubes, we have ovaries. And all of those things mean that there's more looping around those organs on the part of the colon. So I'm not aware of a study looking at rates of SIBO in women versus men, all other things being equal. But I suspect if we did that study, we would find that women do tend to have more SIBO because of the anatomical differences with generally slower transit. We know women have more bloating and constipation. And the anatomical differences on their own, I don't believe would result in SIBO. But when everything else being equal, if you have a woman who's been on long-term acid suppression, antibiotics, birth control pills, steroids, all the rest, and a man who's been on the same medication, maybe with the exception of the birth control pills, um, again, you find that the woman is probably, I would, I would expect, again, I don't have data to back this up, but that the woman would be more likely to have SIBO. And then again, when we think about the next category, which is pharmaceuticals, medications, uh, we know that lots of women take birth control pills or hormone replacement therapy, and that those two things can have serious effects on the microbiome. So there are just medications that women take that might predispose them. Women have higher rates of hypothyroidism and underactive thyroid, and that's often a contributing factor to SIBO. It may be a causative or a contributing factor to dysbiosis in general. It's one of those things where we're not sure whether hypothyroidism causes dysbiosis or whether dysbiosis can cause hypothyroidism, probably both. But certainly if you are hypothyroid and you have slower gastrointestinal motility, as we often see with hypothyroidism, people are constipated, things are slowed down, that can be a predisposing factor. So for the pharmaceutical bucket is deep. As you know, it's antibiotics, it is steroids, birth control pills and hormone replacement therapy, acid suppressing drugs, 
chemotherapy, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And we'll get into this a little bit more in the Q&A. And what we're finding is that almost every drug that people study has some effect on the microbiome. And when you think about it, you take drugs, you ingest them, and then they often become part of the enterohepatic circulation, meaning the circulation between the gut and the liver, because many drugs are metabolized in the liver. So most drugs are gonna have an effect on the GI tract and or the kidneys, just because of the way drugs are ingested. And many of them haven't been studied, but more and more, with these you know, multiple articles that are coming out every week, there are studies looking at different drugs and finding that they do have an effect on gut bacteria. So I would broaden that pharmaceutical bucket ultimately to include, for example, drugs like neuropsychiatric drugs, antidepressants, et cetera, anti-anxiety drugs, uh, drugs that are used for ADD. Many of these drugs are turning out to have an effect on the microbiome. It's very important to take a careful pharmaceutical history, and not just for prescription drugs, but over-the-counter drugs and supplements. You've all seen that little disclaimer on the bottom of the supplement bottle saying these claims have, uh, this drug is not intended to, to treat or cure any disease, and these claims, and often there are many claims being made by the supplement manu manufacturers, but these claims have not been uh, validated by the FDA, this drug has not been tested for safety or efficacy. So I like to point out that supplements are drugs and it's not the same. If you are taking a turmeric supplement, for example, it's not the same as, as using the spiced turmeric. There are other things that go into encapsulating it, increasing the shelf life, helping with the absorption. And not all of those ingredients are always listed on the bottle. So it is, you know, you can't say, well, I'm taking vitamin, a vitamin C pill and that's the same as eating an orange because it's really not. There are additional things in the supplement and there are also additional things in the orange that might be helpful for your health that you're not getting the benefit of with, uh, with just a single pill. So when you think about the pharmaceutical things that can be contributing, don't assume that because you bought a supplement at Whole Foods that it can't potentially be harmful or have an effect on the microbiome. And I like to have as clean a slate as possible. So I really advise my patients to stop anything they're taking that's not essential when we're trying to get things into order. And you know, if they're taking a supplement and they think it's helping dramatically, I'll often do some investigation and make sure that all the ingredients are fine. But my general rule of thumb is stop everything unless, you know, again, there's some essential heart medication or something because chances are if they were taking all this stuff and it were working, they wouldn't be sitting in my office. So um, often people come in with a very big bag of supplements and they've seen one practitioner and they've recommended six or seven supplements and then they see another practitioner and they recommend three or four different ones. And so they're often taking eight or nine different things because often people don't stop one thing before starting something new. And so very, very important to realize that many if not most, if not all, of these things that we take, just as a food we eat has a profound impact on the microbiome, for better or for worse. The things that we ingest in the form of supplements or even herbs and so on can have an effect and an impact on the microbiome, and it's not always positive. So important to keep that in mind. Of course, when it comes to causes, the food the standard American diet really is kind of sets us all up for SIBO in a way. If you think of the fact that the typical American diet, green leafy vegetables make up less than 7% of what people are eating on a daily basis. And uh, I believe the statistic is that more people are eating at McDonald's every day than are eating vegetables every day. So that's a really sobering statistic. And we really have to think about Clearly, food is medicine, and we're going to talk a lot about food in part three, but it's important to consider the dietary factors. We have taken in our practice to having people photograph the food they're eating instead of writing it down, and we find that that sort of photo journal is a more accurate representation of what people are actually eating because people will say, oh, I, you know, I'm eating... Uh, chicken and some rice and some vegetables, but when we see the picture, it's a huge amount of chicken and a huge amount of rice and there are two broccoli florets on the side of the plate. 
So it's a great way to get, I think, a more accurate representation. And rather than have people sit down and historically tell me what they eat for each meal, which is often aspirational, um, we really like to have people, we say, you know, just snap a picture of breakfast, lunch, and dinner and snacks of what you're eating for the next two weeks and bring it in at your next visit. And, um, and again, I think that gives a more realistic picture. So diet obviously plays a huge role. And we know that the things that typically help to grow a good gut garden, the foods that are high in indigestible or poorly digestible plant fiber and that are not processed, uh, foods that are high in inulin, like leeks and garlic and onion and white beans and asparagus and those things are not necessarily the things that are making up the bulk of most people's diet on a daily basis. And the processed foods, processed carbohydrates and uh, refined sugars and lots of oils and so on that can have a detrimental effect on the microbiome in terms of encouraging growth of the less desirable species are unfortunately what most of us are eating on a daily basis. So it's important to not discount the diet. And people will often say to me, well, I've eaten this way my whole life, so why do I have SIBO now? And that may be true, but there may be some other extenuating circumstances. So first of all, the dietary effect is cumulative. And they may have eaten that way their whole life, but now they've been on acid-suppressing drugs for three years, and they've taken six courses of antibiotics in the last year, and they've traveled to Burkina Faso and gotten amoebic dysentery, and uh, they're drinking more alcohol than usual. Remember, alcohol is really bactericidal in the sense that it, it kills bacteria. It's what we use, think about when you go to get blood drawn and they use an alcohol swab on your skin to, to clean the skin and kill off bacteria. And it was the main, was the main weapon that we had to keep things clean in the operating room and so on before antibiotics pre 1928 pre-penicillin. So alcohol, if you drink enough of it, which is probably more than one drink a day consistently, it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of more than five to seven drinks a week. And we, that's sort of an extrapolated figure from studies as well as the number that we know in women increases the risk of malignancies quite dramatically. So if you are uh, not necessarily a heavy drinker, but a consistent drinker, having a couple glasses of wine every night and you're feeling fine, you might tolerate that. But again, in conjunction with the drugs and the diet and maybe an infectious episode, that can often tip you over. And that's sometimes something that people are a little bit resistant to when we're tackling SIBO is the idea that they would become a teetotaler and get rid of alcohol for a period of time until things recover. So it's important to emphasize that alcohol um, can kill off a lot of healthy bacteria. And when your microbiome is already decimated, it's often something that you need to consider. So dietary factors, taking a good dietary history and explaining to people that yes, even though you've eaten this way your whole life, there are other factors going on now that are all working synergistically against you. And the diet is very likely going to have to change. Lifestyle is a big one. I'm fond of saying, if you're not moving, neither are your bowels and neither are your gut bacteria typically are probably not moving from north to south in a timely fashion if you're spending 12 hours a day sitting in a chair. Sitting is the new smoking and it's probably the new antibiotic when we think about gut bacteria is that uh, peristalsis and motility is vitally important to preventing SIBO it may be as important a factor as antibiotics or avoiding antibiotics is movement. So particularly if you are, again, other factors, if you're diabetic or you have MS or you have Parkinson's or you have hypothyroidism or you have any one of the number of conditions that can predispose to constipation or you're on antidepressant medications, an iron supplement, uh, aluminum containing, antacids, any one of the drugs that we know can contribute to constipation and slow down motility, and then now you're also sedentary, that can really be, um, that can really have a significant impact on whether or not you develop SIBO because again of slow motility. So it's helpful to think of lifestyle in terms of contribution to the motility 
effect. And even if you're going to Soul Cycle or Orange Theory or Bar 3 and working out like a demon for an hour or two every day, <clears throat> if you're spending an additional 12 or 14 hours sitting, that is a problem. So lifestyle, again, it, it's sort of the way we live these days, right? We're sitting down on our devices for much of the time, as I am on mine right now, but, but only for an hour or two. So that's another contributing factor. And it's so important for you as a patient or as a practitioner to identify these factors and explain to people that fixing this problem is not a simple matter of taking a pill. It would be great if it were, but that's a little bit of magical thinking to think that, oh yeah, just take this supplement or this you know, rifaximin or whatever it is and you'll be fine. You have to look at this in the setting and the context in which it develops. And it's much like fatigue, for example. If I saw somebody, and I try not to see people just for fatigue, I try to keep my practice very gut specific, but fatigue is often one of the symptoms people are complaining about. But if you look at a symptom like fatigue, um, it's rare that it's just one thing. And even chronic fatigue syndrome, which different studies have pointed to viral etiologies and so on, but if you look at many of those patients, there are multiple things. There are medications that make them tired, they have disturbed sleep patterns, they don't eat a very good diet, they have other conditions or again, other medications that are contributing to it. So there are often six or seven or eight different things that you can point to between, and even sort of anatomical, if you will, for fatigue. It might be that uh, the bed they're sleeping in or the room they're sleeping in, in terms of light coming in or noise and so on is waking them up. There are drugs they're taking. They're in their diet, they're caffeinating in the morning, and even though they're having coffee at 7 a.m. and they can't fall asleep at midnight, there's still caffeine in their system or other stimulant things. Alcohol is actually a stimulant for a lot of things, not a sedative as people think it is. So they're having a glass of wine and that's keeping them up. There's anxiety, they're worrying about their kid or their job or something else, and uh, they're sedentary. So they're much the same way we look at lots of these other things, the idea that somebody's gonna come along, do a test, identify something, hand you a pill, and that's the end of your problems, unfortunately is not generally the case. And certainly if you are a patient with SIBO and you're on this call, that's probably not been your experience. And if you're a practitioner, that's typically not the patient who's gonna come and see you because those people get better and go about their business. There's just few people who really have that very sort of isolated, very treatable SIBO. But for most people, there's gonna be a chronicity and it's going to be very important to identify these other factors so you can help people tackle these other things and figure out how they're going to fix them. So I want to describe to you what, what I sort of see as a perfect storm. And this is an actual patient who came to see me some time ago. This is a 69 year old male stockbroker. He might've been a hedge fund guy or something, but something in the finance world where there was a lot of stress and there was a lot of sitting. He had a very sedentary lifestyle. He was a heavy drinker, two to three drinks a day. He'd been on Nexium for 17 years for reflux. And uh, in terms of his food, which we'll skip through, he was a meat and potatoes diet, but he often ate quite late at 9, 10 o'clock at night. And lunch was almost always at his desk. He'd been on multiple courses of antibiotics over the last several years for prostatitis. And he went on a cruise with his family and he got norovirus as about a third of the cruise ship did. And to add insult to injury, they treated the norovirus with antibiotics, even though they knew it was norovirus and it's a viral infection, they're not responsive to antibiotics. But we see this sort of CYA medicine being practiced all the time. And really because there is such a poor appreciation amongst medical practitioners about the harmful effects of antibiotics. I think the lay public is typically much more tuned in, but the doctors don't seem to have gotten the memo that antibiotics are not a great idea unless absolutely necessary. So he got an additional course of antibiotics on top of the norovirus. The norovirus itself was damaging to the microbiome, essentially with the diarrhea and the proliferation of the viral organisms, a lot of the healthy bacteria was depleted. And we see that in what we call post-infectious IBS, which is often SIBO, where people get an infectious illness, often not something super severe, something like norovirus, 
but they don't ever recover because that can be the straw that breaks the camel's back and it tips them over. And now they're sort of terrible, right? They have gas and bloating and diarrhea or constipation and uh, they're just not the same after that. And um, that is often the effect of the viral or fungal or bacterial infection on the microbiome plus minus any medication they're given. They're often given antibiotics and acid suppressing drugs to treat the symptoms, which is a terrible trifecta. So he got norovirus and he ended up with what was initially diagnosed as post-infectious SIBO by his primary care doc and several months into it wasn't getting better. And he came to see us and he had a breath test that was positive. And as we'll talk about in part two, you don't always need to do a breath test. They can be helpful, but they can also hinder diagnosis and they can be unreliable. So in this patient, I'm not sure I needed a breath test, but he had one and it was positive and trying to convince him that this isn't a sort of one and done. In his mind, he identified the cruise and getting sick with a turning point. He's like, something happened and we need to make it on happen. And it was quite frankly, very challenging explaining to him how all these different things were sort of adding up to him developing SIBO because let's face it, it's much more appealing to be a victim. <laughs> Right, than a volunteer. So it's, it's just a nicer feeling to think like, okay, this thing happened to me and you're gonna wave a magic wand and make it on happen or you're gonna give me a pill and make it on happen opposed to, as opposed to the idea that really my two to three drinks every night and my unhealthy diet and my sedentary lifestyle and these drugs that my doctor gave me that I've just been taking without question are part of the problem because now there's work to be done that involves really, really profound changes in how people eat, what they eat and what they drink and how they live. And that often involves some discomfort, right? And inconvenience. And so, you know, I feel like I'm constantly the bearer of bad news um, when I tell people, you know, I think we can improve this significantly. I'm not sure we can get you completely back to your previous baseline but I think we can really make this a lot better, but there are a lot of things that have to change. And, and again, I think it's helpful to phrase it in terms of you might need to make some more significant changes now and over time as you're better, we can reintroduce some of these things from a dietary standpoint or some of these habits. But in the beginning, I want you to make some really significant changes so we can see how good we can get this. And then if some of the not so good habits creep back in, but you're feeling okay, that's fine. Because I feel like if you don't make those more dramatic changes initially, then people don't see the improvement and they, you know, they're sort of discouraged, right? So I always think it's better to hit it hard for the first sort of 30 days so that people can feel significantly better and can be optimistic and excited about really the effects of these different changes and how much control actually they have over how they feel, as opposed to making one small change every week and you know six weeks later, they're still not there. So there is no wrong or right way to do this, but that's generally the approach in my office. I find that by the time people come to see me, they've typically seen their primary care, one or two or three or four gastroenterologists, a, a naturopath or a functional medicine doctor, and uh, maybe an herbalist or someone else. They've typically seen a lot of people. They've been treated with a lot of different things, but often the thing that they haven't done is looked at this broader platform on which SIBO often sits and made changes there. Sometimes they've uh, often, I will say, from a dietary point of view, they've made a lot of changes, but in taking out, not always adding in. So they've taken out gluten and they've taken out dairy and they've taken out refined sugar but they're still not eating the six to eight servings of vegetables that we really find people need. Where they're not sort of creating that good growth medium for the bacteria with lots of swamp juice, as I like to call it, from the green smoothies and the tons of salads and tons and tons of vegetables uh, that they need to eat. So there's often a significant level of frustration. They're like, I've taken four courses of Cyfaxin and I've taken all this anti-yeast medication, all these antifungals for months, and I've taken, I've been on a paleo diet, often not a great idea. I've taken out the gluten and the dairy and the sugar, and I'm still not better. What's going on? There must be something else. 
and there often is, but again, the often is might involve changing some other things. So this is a classic example, this patient, of the multifactorial etiology <clears throat> of SIBO and the straw that breaks the camel's back in this case is a norovirus, but again, look at the context in which this is developing. And this also, I think, really speaks well to the concept of terrain, that this person does not have healthy terrain, but he didn't know he didn't have healthy terrain. He was just sort of going along about his business. I suspect he didn't feel great a lot of the time, but he felt okay, and I don't think he ever had any reason to question his terrain, to really think about his thought garden until he really started to have significant symptoms of bloating and gas and diarrhea and really foul smelling gas and felt like, gosh, something is really off. So again, I, I um, just want to remind you to look at that dysbiosis checklist and to really think about all the different factors. Of course, we can't go back, you know, if you have the misfortune of being born by a C-section and not being nursed, there's not a lot we can do about that, but there are other things that we can do. And we'll talk about them in part three to sort of remediate the damage. I would like to, again, emphasize that the varied manifestations. So we talk about varied causes, but there are varied presentations of SIBO also. It can manifest in many different ways. And the symptoms depend on a number of things, but the colonization patterns is one. There, there I'm sure, will be multiple other factors that we will determine down the road in terms of why one person with SIBO has brain fog and fatigue and joint pain and constipation and why somebody else has diarrhea and bloating and um, nausea, for example. But one of the things that we know is, for example, whether there's overproduction more of hydrogen or methane. So methane is strongly correlated with constipation and hydrogen is more correlated with diarrhea, but it is not as simple as that. The absolute number of organisms plays a role too. So typically in the proximal small bowel, we have less than a thousand organisms per milliliter of fluid, as opposed to, and they're mostly gram positive, as opposed to further down in the colon where we can have literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions. So there is a, a dramatic increase in that gradient in terms of the number of organisms. The small intestine is not sterile by any stretch of the imagination, but typically many fewer organisms. So the absolute number of organisms, if you have uh, a lot of reflux of colonic contents into the small intestine because of an anatomical reason, for example, you have Crohn's disease and you have had the terminal ileum resected as well as the ileocecal valve, which is that little sphincter that prevents the contents of digestion, the products of digestion from moving from the colon back up in a reverse peristaltic way, back up into the small intestine. If you have Crohn's and that's gone and you also have scarring and fibrosis and slow motility and you're also on a steroid and you're also taking antibiotics and all the rest and you end up with SIBO, you may have way more organisms in the small intestine than somebody who doesn't have those anatomical considerations and you may have much more severe SIBO as a result. The type of flora present can also determine the type of symptoms you have. And I'm giving you three examples here. These are not the only three, but these are three sort of classic ones. So if, for example, in, in the first type, you have a predominance of bacteria that metabolize bile salts and deconjugate bile salts, that can lead to fat malabsorption because bile salts emulsify fat to help absorb it. It's sort of like the dishwashing liquid on a greasy plate. If you have a greasy plate and you're trying to clean it with just water, it might be very difficult to wash the grease away. But if you put some dishwashing detergent on the plate, that now emulsifies the grease and all of a sudden the plate is clean. So the bile salts can emulsify uh, the fat, help to bind it and help to absorb it. They essentially help to carry it through the digestive membrane. And if you don't have enough of those bacteria that are involved in metabolizing and absorbing um, the bile salts that, that are involved in absorbing the fat, you can get fat malabsorption or a bile salt diarrhea where 
almost anything you eat is irritating and will cause diarrhea. If we have a, a second type there, we have bacteria that metabolize carbohydrates to short chain fatty acids and, and other products that can be absorbed. You can have bloating from the hydrogen and methane, but not diarrhea because the metabolites that might cause diarrhea are absorbed. If in the third example, you have a lot of gram negative bacteria like Klebsiella species, they can produce toxins that damage a mucosa and cause a secretory diarrhea that kind of stimulate the lining to secrete fluid and interfere with the absorptive function. And you can get increase in secretion and diarrhea, almost like a cholera type picture or a Shiga toxin type picture. So you can have SIBO and be very constipated. You can have SIBO and have normal bowel movements. You can have SIBO and have profound diarrhea. You can be an alternator. You can have SIBO and, and alternate like with irritable bowel syndrome between constipation and diarrhea. And you can have lots of gas and bloating. You can have a little gas and bloating, lots of different symptoms. They're, they vary depending on what's going on with the different organisms. And of course, some of that will be determined by what the cause of the SIBO is. If it's antibiotics, it will depend on what the spectrum of the antibiotic is and which bacteria have been killed. Uh, I mean, that's sort of a simplistic way of putting it, but which bacteria are sort of preferentially over or under represented, or if it's food, what this specific microbial effect of the diet is. So there are lots of factors. And when you consider that we've identified thousands of bacterial species, but there's still probably thousands more we haven't identified, we don't know what their function is, um, this can become there can be big question marks here, clearly. So we're going to go to the next slide. And I want to talk a bit about the prevalence of SIBO. When we get to the question, somebody had asked, gosh, it seems like everyone has SIBO. And you know, it, it's sort of true. So if we look at healthy people, these are statistics that are compiled from several different studies. If we look at healthy people and we test them, the range is anywhere from 2.5% to 22%, depending on what population of healthy people we're looking at and also what modality of testing we're using. The breath test will often yield higher results than uh, culture and aspirate when we sort of suck fluid out of the small intestine and culture it. So depending on the test being used and how carefully people are doing the test and depending on the cohort. So for example, in a population over 60, there are much higher rates of SIBO than in a younger population. And this probably has to do with decreased motility as we get older, decreased enzymatic activity, and an increase in the number of medications that most people over 60, for example, are taking. So lots of different factors. But SIBO does seem to exist in who we would identify as healthy people who are essentially asymptomatic. If we look at irritable bowel syndrome, it's anywhere from 30 to 85%, depending on the study. And irritable bowel syndrome is not synonymous with SIBO, but SIBO is one of the many slices of the IBS pie, if you will. So I personally reject the whole idea of the diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome because it's kind of like chronic fatigue syndrome is why are you fatigued? There's not one specific thing that's irritable bowel syndrome. If we slice up the pie, we see undiagnosed lactose intolerance, fructose intolerance, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, gluten sensitivity, parasites, motility disorders, SIBO. We see lots of different things that can cause SIBO, that can cause IBS. So to describe it as a condition into and of itself, is really, we're really lumping when we should be splitting. We should be taking IBS and rolling up our sleeves and figuring out why do you have your IBS? I see people who come in who have symptomatic diverticulosis where their colon is full of diverticular orifices, those little potholes in the colon that are common in people over 50 who do not eat a high fiber diet. And they have classic symptoms of diverticulosis of incomplete evacuation and multiple small stools and lots of other symptoms, left lower quadrant discomfort, and they've been told they have IBS. And I'm like, you don't have IBS. It's a diagnosis of exclusion, right? You have diverticulosis, and that's what's causing your symptoms. Or you have SIBO, and that's what's causing your symptoms. So IBS is sort of a very convenient way to lump all these symptoms together and for the pharmaceutical companies in cahoots with the doctors to come up with a code 
that we could then create lots of drugs for that could be reimbursed, most of which do not address the root cause of IBS. So if you have IBS, for example, because you're lactose intolerant, taking any one of the drugs that are out there for irritable bowel syndrome are not going to solve your problem. And that's why so many people who are on these drugs say they're not helping. So if you have IBS-C, which is IBS that's constipation predominant, or IBS-D, that's IBS diarrhea predominant, there are different drugs for those two different things, but the drugs really are like a Band-Aid. They treat the symptoms, they don't treat the cause. And um, there is, again, not to get too far off topic here, there are many causes of irritable bowel syndrome and SIBO is one, but it's not the only one. If we look at refractory celiac disease, we see a rate of 50% of rates of prevalence of SIBO in patients with refractory celiac disease. And that's because we know from a lot of the Scandinavian studies that in people who are genetically susceptible, which is about one in four of people of European descent and varies in people of other ethnic backgrounds. But if you have one of the genetic subtypes that are associated with an increased risk of celiac disease, there is often an environmental trigger that then will result in you actually developing celiac disease. And we know, again, from the Scandinavian studies, from the Swedish registry and so on, that that environmental trigger is often a course of antibiotics or several courses of antibiotics that predisposes somebody to actually develop celiac disease. So it makes perfect sense that if, let's say, for example, you are HLA DQ2 and DQ8 positive, and you are in terms of the haplotypes that are associated with celiac disease, and you are sort of predisposed, you have an increased likelihood of developing celiac disease, and then you are given a month of doxycycline for Lyme disease, which you may or may not have, <laughs> that's a whole other webinar, and you then develop symptoms and get tested, and lo and behold, you now have celiac disease, well, taking out gluten is an important part of fixing the celiac disease, but it doesn't address the holes in your microbiome that have been created by the doxycycline and other, other, you know, sort of things that you might have done, again, the acid suppression, et cetera. So removing gluten in somebody with celiac disease does not fix dysbiosis, and dysbiosis is a frequent traveler with celiac disease. So that's very important. If you yourself struggle with celiac disease and think that you might have SIBO, or if you're seeing patients with celiac disease, that taking out the gluten alone might not be enough. And I see that all the time in my practice. And then when we test for SIBO, or we just look at the symptoms and the other extenuating circumstances, we find that this person really needs to, in addition to taking out gluten, they need to add in a lot more plant fiber and of course, what can often happen when patients are diagnosed with celiac disease is first they're really sort of shocked. Oh my goodness, how am I going to live without gluten? And then they take a trip to Whole Foods or Safeway or Giant or any supermarket and they're like, oh my goodness, look at all this great gluten-free stuff. Look at the gluten-free pancakes and the gluten-free cookies and the gluten-free tortillas and oh, I can just eat all this gluten-free stuff and I'll be fine. And so they swap the gluten for lots of gluten-free processed carbohydrates that are almost as bad, if not equally as bad for the microbiome, and they don't put in any of the stuff they need to support the health and growth of the microbes we're actually trying to encourage, and their symptoms really don't get all the way better. So refractory celiac disease often is dysbiosis. And unfortunately, what does the medical community do? They put those people on immune-suppressing drugs. They put them on heavy-duty drugs like uh, azathioprine and others that suppress the immune system and never really sort of get to the root cause of why their celiac disease may be refractory. We know in patients with liver cirrhosis that as many as 50% of them may have SIBO. The lactose intolerant elderly, I believe that study looked at patients ages 70 to 94 and found 90% of them who are lactose intolerant had SIBO in patients who are morbidly obese who are asymptomatic, otherwise in terms of SIBO, up to 17%. And I think if we looked at obese patients who were symptomatic, it would be much higher. 
And again, I think that speaks to the shared etiology between SIBO and obesity. A lot of the factors that contribute to obesity in terms of a sedentary lifestyle and the dietary factors and lots of antibiotic use, all those things that conspire to have you um, have difficulty losing weight also conspire to create SIBO. And uh, we know that antibiotic fattening has been used in the animal industry for a long time and that feeding animals antibiotics can result in up to a 15% or more weight gain. So you see again that Venn diagram intersecting at multiple places in terms of etiology. And then of course, proton pump inhibitor users up to 53%. So if you ha have been taking a proton pump inhibitor for more than three months at a time, or certainly the longer you've been taking it, probably the higher the risk, you can pretty much flip a coin and know that you're gonna have SIBO with sort of a coin toss, right? 50%, it's actually 53%, so even higher. So this should give you a sense of what we're dealing with here, that we have multiple causes of SIBO and we have intersection with lots of different conditions. I talked about hypothyroidism and not knowing, you know, is it the chicken or the egg? Did the hypothyroidism cause a SIBO? Did the SIBO cause a hypothyroidism? And we see the same thing here with a lot of these other conditions where it's probably both the factors that contribute to SIBO contribute to these other diseases. And then these other diseases, once established, can also be sort of the driving force for the SIBO. So much more complicated than just a breath test and a supplement or a pill, right? I wish that were the case. My, uh, my office visits would be a lot, a lot faster and a lot smoother if that were the case and I were just sort of dispensing breath tests and then handing out prescriptions and everybody was on their way and getting better. So I want to spend some time addressing the questions because you sent in some really terrific questions and they touch on some of the things I haven't covered so far and some of the things that might not have been uh, explained in detail in the book. So the first question was about estrogen. Estrogen is mentioned as having an association with SIBO. Is there SIBO risk if one uses a topical estrogen in hormone replacement therapy? And the answer to that is a resounding yes. When they ha when they have studied the absorption of Premarin and Estrace, two of the common um, estrogen-containing compounds that are used topically, that are used either in, uh, vaginally or on the skin in postmenopausal women, they found that the vaginal absorption is rapid and it is sustained, and it results in sustained high estrogen levels in the systemic circulation. So the answer to that is yes. The second question was about genes that are mentioned as related to SIBO, NOD2 and some others that are associated with inflammatory bowel disease. What is the relevance of these? I probably should not have included the inflammatory bowel disease information in the packet. I was trying to be very comprehensive and to show that with celiac disease and IBD and so on, that dysbiosis alterations in gut bacteria can contribute to those diseases. But um, I didn't mean to sort of conflate inflammatory bowel disease with SIBO. But this question, it was a longer question. It asked about SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And SNPs are really a common type of genetic variation. Each one represents a difference in a single building block in the DNA. And they're the kind of mutation that, that can occur in the coding or the non-coding parts of the DNA, essentially in the genes, the coding parts or not. And so the relevance of mentioning it in that section was just to show that even when you have a genetic predisposition to a disease like inflammatory bowel disease or celiac disease, it's the environmental trigger, which is often in the form of heavy antibiotic use or the standard American diet or an infectious process that leads to the actual manifestation and expression of the disease. So that was question two. Question three. How do you recommend we address the overuse of PPIs with doctors who are constantly prescribing them? Well, I have tried hitting them over the head with a frying pan, and that does not seem to have done the trick. Um, and I will say that most of the gastroenterologists I know, certainly when I think about my colleagues at Georgetown and others, they're very well-meaning. They want people to get better, but they're very busy. The office visit is short. There's not a lot of time. And sometimes they are not as well informed, quite frankly, as they should be, or as a lay public is sometimes, about the downstream effects. So you have to remember that much of our medical education 
comes from the pharmaceutical companies. That's a sad truth. Not directly in the sense that there's somebody from the drug company giving talks at our meetings, but indirectly. There is this whole uh, sort of MO where pharmaceutical companies target people who are considered key opinion leaders in a field. And I know about this because I was one back in the day before I had my awakening. And I did a lot of research in inflammatory bowel disease and was, was sort of identified as a key opinion leader by a couple of different pharmaceutical companies. And you're invited to important scientific meetings and you're sort of wined and dined, but more importantly, you're ego stroked into thinking that, oh, you know, you're such a leader in this field and we'd love you to help spread the word and educate your colleagues. And years ago, that was sort of, you know, would you give a talk that will sponsor to your colleagues about whatever it was, you know, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And you feel a little guilty, like, gosh, maybe I should mention their drug. They've set up this wonderful dinner for 40 physicians and they have me speaking. So maybe I'll give a little shout out to the drug, nothing too promotional. And then that over the years sort of changed to, oh, we have this wonderful slide set that our team, our research team, which is usually the marketing team, has developed and we think some of these slides could be useful to you for your talk and the slides are always very professionally done. And um, you think, oh gosh, these slides are great and the slides describe the study with pretty much always a positive outcome for their drug, promoting their drug and you start using those slides. And then over time that changed to, we have a slide set that we'd like you to use and we don't want you to add or subtract any slides. We want you to use our slide deck as is, which is always very promotional. And then over time you realize you're really just doing marketing for the pharmaceutical industry. You're really not doing education. You're helping them to sell drugs, but you're so sort of, you've been so uh, indoctrinated into thinking that you are an important voice in the medical arena and that you're really doing medical education. So it's, it's very difficult uh, to get around that because the people that they're hearing the information from are often people who are respected leaders within the GI community. And it's not a sort of obvious thing where it's not like a drug company is paying you $100,000 to give this talk. They're often supporting your work with research grants and so on. So if we think about, for example, the research that's been done on rifaximin, it's come mostly from one lab, from a very respected gastroenterologist who's a terrific guy, but is supported primarily by the pharmaceutical company that makes the product that he is studying in a lot of the studies. And of course, pharmaceutical companies are usually not in the business of supporting publication of studies where their drug does not have a positive outcome. So how do we address the overuse of PPIs with doctors who are constantly prescribing them? I think it's direct to consumer. You know, the pharmaceutical companies went direct to consumer for trying to advertise their drugs. We need to go direct to consumer for advocating against non-judicious use of these drugs. Not to say these drugs are terrible. These drugs are great when we really need them. When people have an acute uh, duodenal or gastric ulcer that's bleeding, these drugs are great for using for six to eight weeks at a time to heal that ulcer or for patients who have something called Zollinger-Ellison syndrome where they hypersecrete acid, uh, a rare disorder, but for patients who have it, the drug is a great idea. The drug is not a great idea for the average person who has reflux, who really needs to clean up their act a little bit with less coffee, less alcohol, smaller dinner, bigger breakfast, less late night eating, more moving, all of that. Not a great idea to put that person on Nexium for 17 years. So I think we have to really think about having well-informed consumers and really teaching people that they need to be strong advocates for their own health. And when they're handed a prescription, they need to raise their eyebrows and ask some questions. They need to do their own research. All of the stuff is available on the internet. And I think that is an important role of health coaches because physicians are much less likely, quite frankly, to talk about side effects of drugs and so on. So I think this is where health coaches can play a huge role in terms of helping people advocate and raising these issues about the potential side effects of these drugs. And uh, so we have, to, we have to really encourage people to just say no and to do the more difficult work of because changing how they live and what they eat. Because of course a PPI, when you're taking it, oh, I can eat that porterhouse at 10 o'clock with the creamed spinach and the 
mashed potatoes and my two gin and tonics and some ice cream and I don't feel nearly half as bad as when I don't take the Nexium. So it really is sort of a band-aid and it can obscure the damage that the diet and lifestyle are doing. The reflux symptoms are your body going knock knock, I, I don't like what you're doing. And so when you sort of dampen that knock knock, it allows you to continue to do those things that are harmful to the digestive tract and to your body. But I don't have a, a better answer for you, uh, unfortunately, to how to get doctors to change. So the other thing that will probably happen, class action lawsuits are an incredibly powerful tool for getting physicians to change the way they prescribe. We saw it in the dermatology world where dermatologists were prescribing Accutane for acne um, very inappropriately as first line therapy. And that class action lawsuit with Accutane causing colitis, which was probably not just the Accutane, but also all the antibiotics that people are on for acne before they go on Accutane, that was causing the ulcerative colitis. But that really changed prescribing habits of dermatologists quite dramatically. So the lay press has done a great job of educating the public about the potential harmful side effects of proton pump inhibitors in terms of other systemic illnesses they can cause or contribute to like dementia and kidney disease and heart disease, uh, increased fracture risk, all the other things that they do. And I think with that awareness, we've seen changes in proton pump inhibitor use, not so much in the prescribing, but we've seen educated patients going to their doctors and saying, get me off this thing. Or I, I'm telling them, I'm gonna stop taking this thing. I read an article about dementia. All the older people in my family have Alzheimer's. I don't wanna get dementia. I wanna be off this drug. So it really is about education and spreading the word. Next set of questions. Can we speak about acid suppressors in more detail during the webinar? I, I feel like we sort of flogged that horse, um, but I just wanna remind you a little bit about the mechanism is that stomach acid is one of the body's main barriers, main defenses against um, bacteria that get into the body through the mouth. And so when we remove that stomach acid as those drugs so effectively and efficiently do, we end up with a more alkaline, hospitable, friendly environment for bacteria to overgrow in the upper GI tract, especially. And that's why we see that overrepresentation of mouse species in the colon. A lot of those mouse species that should have been destroyed by stomach acid are now traveling down to the colon and, and changing what the normal ecosystem should be like. And uh, so that's one way they do it. They also because of creating an alkali environment, they make pancreatic enzymes less effective because they're designed to work at a certain pH. And when that pH is changed dramatically, the digestive enzymes are less active. And that is also something that can probably contribute to SIBO from a causative point of view. And also there's less absorption of nutrients of fat soluble vitamins, A, D, and K, of magnesium and iron and so on. And that lack of nutrient absorption is something that can lead to senescence and sort of early aging of different cells throughout the body. So again, these things have profound ramifications throughout the body. And these are not things that you can just take every day and expect that there's not going to be a downside. And we're seeing with SIBO, what we're seeing is that because gut bacteria are so essential to our health and because they're also so fragile, we see that so many things that we do and we don't think about because we've been doing it for a long time are now causing problems and we're now seeing the manifestations and we now have sort of names and faces for these things which were heretofore just i don't feel well and geez maybe you just have ibs and now we know that it is it's more complicated and and also sort of more concrete the changes than that the next question was, do topical NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which are really ibuprofen type drugs, such as Voltaren, diclofenac sodium, have any impact on the gut microbiome? If so, what is the mechanism through which an NSAID applied to the skin causes an effect on microbes in the gut? So the same thing as the first question about estrogen, there is systemic absorption of these drugs. They are measurable in the systemic circulation. We don't think of NSAIDs as having a direct effect on gut bacteria, but I want to run you through the steps in terms of how they can affect the microbiome and lead to SIBO. They can cause local damage. So the erosions and ulcers that I see in the GI tract with my endoscope or my colonoscope when I'm doing endoscopy are a direct effect, sort of local damage. 
but they also get into what we call the enterohepatic circulation, that circulation between the digestive tract and the liver. And there's enterohepatic recycling, meaning that they're moving through that circulation over and over and over again, resulting in prolonged and repeated exposure of the gut lining to the compound. So it's not sort of a one and done. And when you have an impaired barrier, when these drugs, as they do, cause these little holes in the gut lining, you get bacterial movement, bacterial translocation through the gut lining, gets into the liver circulation, and it can cause what we call endotoxemia, which is an inflammatory response. And that inflammatory response can occur in the liver, and it can cause NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, or what we call fatty liver. So most people don't realize that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are associated with fatty liver. And I think most of my GI colleagues probably don't realize that. And of course, fatty liver, remember we saw the association with cirrhosis and so on. Fatty liver can also uh, probably cause and be and contribute to SIBO. So it can be caused and affect there. So there's an example of uh, sort of more distant relationship with how a drug can affect another organ, which can affect your likelihood of developing SIBO. The next question, number six, was, I think we, we answered reading typical SIBO symptoms. One, we think that absolutely everyone, in all caps, out there has SIBO. I'd like to get more direction how to look at these symptoms and distinguish that they are potentially SIBO-caused versus potentially not SIBO-caused, especially since laboratory tests aren't perfect. So I think I, give you a good, I gave you a good lay of the land in terms of how prevalent this is. But if you're looking for some sort of linear equation that if you have this, you have SIBO, you treat with this, you're better, um, then I have some bad news for you, is that it, it is often not linear. And in the same way we look at something like back pain or fatigue or weight gain, it's not linear, right? I have back pain because I play a lot of squash and <laughs> at my advanced age, I'm creaky, so the squash hurts my back. I sit a lot at work on the days when I see patients, and that contributes to my back pain. I don't stretch enough or do as much yoga as I used to, so there are multiple reasons why I'm having back pain. Maybe that wasn't the best example. Or I'll go back to the fatigue example, right? Or um, why somebody might be gaining weight. They might be gaining weight because they're on a bunch of drugs that are associated with weight gain. Like they might be taking the pill and an antidepressant and maybe an anti-seizure medication that all are associated with weight gain. They are eating a diet that is low in indigestible plant fiber and high in saturated fat and processed carbs and refined sugar. They are sedentary. They are depressed. They are, um, you know, multiple different things. They have hypothyroidism. They are postmenopausal. They have lots of different factors. So if you ask me to just draw, identify one cause that is equal to their weight gain, and that's why if you think about something like weight gain and obesity, it's so challenging to treat, much as the way SIBO is. So some people, it's like, okay, you have weight gain just because you're on this antidepressant. You stop the antidepressant, you lose weight, you're fine. But that's definitely not the typical experience for people who struggle with their weight. And they change their diet, and they still can't lose weight, and they exercise more, and they still can't lose weight because there are probably 17 different things that have contributed to their weight gain, including some factors that we can change, like the fact that they might have been a C-section baby and lots of antibiotics at birth or in childhood, which we know are also associated with obesity. So this uh, idea that we can say what symptoms are SIBO-related versus not is, is just not the way it works. And I would really caution you on the practitioner side to set expectations with your patients that you know, you're going to go on this diet, take this probiotic, and then, you know, these 11 symptoms you came in with of joint pain, fatigue, brain fog, et cetera, are all going to go away. Many of them might get better, and some may go away completely. But again, some of these other factors are multifactorial because for PPIs, for example, don't just cause issues with gut bacteria. They affect the digestive system in a much more profound way. And if you look at all the other things they can contribute to, kidney disease, dementia, heart disease, uh, bone fractures, they're obviously having a profound and varied effect on the body. And the same is true of a lot of the factors that cause SIBO. 
So your birth control pills and antibiotics and poor diet and sedentary lifestyle that all got you to the point of having SIBO have also created other problems within the body, undoubtedly, and those are not all necessarily going to be undone and fixed by the treatment for SIBO. So I think it's very important to set realistic expectations for people that there are things that you can do that can really help, but you have to look at it in this broader context. And it's often not this linear relationship. Number seven, how can SIBO cause difficulty losing weight and or weight loss? Would this be dictated by which bacterial strains are imbalanced? So I think the question here is, how can SIBO both cause weight gain and weight loss? And um, that's exactly right. It will depend on the constellation of bacteria we can't say specifically which ones very precisely because we don't know, but I can give you some examples. For example, there is a family of bacteria, Kristen Senalacea, and their family of gram-negative bacteria, and they're associated with a reduction in body weight and a low BMI. So high Kristen Senalacea equal low BMI, lower weight. And they seem to be genetic in some sense in that they're inherited, but that's always difficult to parse out because families often eat the same food and have similar lifestyle. But we can't just take Kristen Senalacea from somebody and give it to somebody who's obese and expect the weight to go down because ultimately the Kristen Senalacea depend on the proliferation, depend on what you feed them. And these bacteria, whether it's C. calibacterium prosnitzii that has a protective effect against metabolic syndrome and heart disease and cancer and so on, Fecalobacterium prosnitzia, or F. prosnitzia, as, as I like to call it, is more prevalent in vegans and people who eat a high fiber diet. So there's no way, if you're eating meat and potatoes every day, to go borrow some F. prosnitzia from your vegan friend and take it as a probiotic and think it's going to make you skinny. You've got to eat the same food your vegan friend is eating if you want to grow your population of F. prosnitzia and have uh, the same weight they do. So we'd like to think that we can just swap microbes. And there've been lots of enchanting experiments and studies from WashU and St. Louis. I think I included that in the packet where they took microbes from twins, one obese and one lean, and transplanted them to germ-free mice. And the mouse that received the microbes from the obese twin started to gain weight without any significant changes in diet and so on. We haven't been able to do the reverse with, in, in a sustainable way. We can transplant for, we can transplant microbes from skinny mice to germ-free mice that have been made obese and reduce their weight, but it really, not in a really prolonged and sustained way and not without transplanting multiple microbes. So in the WashU studies, when they transplanted, I think it was 54 species, they saw some of the weight gain, but when they transplanted 39, they did not. And that's Jeffrey Gordon was a researcher at WashU in St. Louis, if you want to if you want to look at that. So when we look at weight loss and weight gain, the microbiome is involved in determining and altering how we store fat, in how we balance glucose, and how we respond to hormones, in hormones like ghrelin that make us feel full or hungry. And we know some general things. We know lean people have a more diverse microbial community. It's true of humans, it's true of mice. They have a wider variety of bacteria and we know that certain families like Bacteroidetes are better represented in lean people. We know obese people have a less diverse microbiome. They have sort of monoculture. They have certain species that dominate. And uh, we can think of it as sort of job vacancies for microbes that perform key roles in maintaining a healthy body weight and normal metabolism. And when those job vacancies aren't filled, we run into problems maintaining a healthy body weight and normal metabolism. And we know that obese mice have higher levels in the blood of certain substances like branched chain amino acids that may be byproducts of microbial metabolism. If you think about, it's a really interesting way to think about something like H. pylori, which is very maligned. Helicobacter pylori, you know, a gastroenterologist won the Nobel Prize for uh, determining the association between H. pylori and stomach ulcers. And since then, the mantra in gastroenterology has been the only good H. pylori is a dead H. pylori. But H. pylori, as Dr. Martin Blazer points out in his book, Missing Microbes, which is a great book, I encourage you to read it. H. pylori 
has been around for a long time. And we were very, most of us were colonized with H. pylori until widespread sanitation with chlorination of the water and widespread use of antibiotics killed off a lot of the H. pylori. And it, it's a bacteria that, yes, it can be associated with ulcers and certain strains, even with cancer, the GI tract, but H. pylori can also help to regulate appetite by modulating levels of ghrelin, the hunger stimulating hormone. And uh, again, it used to be abundant, but now it's rare. And obesity used to be rare, and now it's abundant. So it makes you wonder about the association between eradicating H. pylori and obesity, not a linear relationship in terms of cause and effect, but one of the many factors in our super sanitized lifestyle that may result in an increase in obesity. And uh, again, just to frame the, the lean obese, we know that diet affects diversity. With a, so this combination of a high fat diet and obesity is, is really um, something that can lead to a dramatic increase in weight gain. And we've seen it with animals and we see it in humans. So kids that are exposed to a lot of antibiotics in childhood and then also eat the standard American diet, high fat diet, that's really a recipe for obesity. So that was the answer to question seven. And uh, question eight, what is the physiologic pathway for gut microbiome, for gut microbes to neutralize toxins? Well, the answer is we don't exactly know all the pathways, but we know some of them. So for example, we know that strains of E. coli that produce Shiga toxin can cause diarrhea and kidney failure and other problems. And then there are bacteria that contain receptors for these toxins on their surface that actually absorb and neutralize the Shiga toxin. It's called contact-dependent interbacterial antagonism or contact-dependent killing. And we know that certain bacteria can actually activate genes that can metabolize harmful compounds. So there are multiple mechanisms by which gut bacteria can neutralize toxins. Number nine. These two statements in the PDF about the microbiome seem incongruent. The microbiome we have today isn't the one we were born with, nor is it the one we'll have next year or even next week. It's highly dynamic, constantly changing and adjusting in response to our internal external environment. And the second statement was the microbiome reflects everything about you. It's a more unique identifier than your own DNA. Yes, the microbiome is constantly changing, but it is still unique and representing us. So I, representing everything that we've done so it's dynamic, as are our genes, although the microbiome is more dynamic than the genes. So it is changing, but it is still uniquely personal. Question number 10. Bacteria in the colon consume dietary fiber and produce short-chain fatty acids, which are used as energy for bacteria. And then there are a couple questions. Is it fair to think of short-chain fatty acids as fuel for the bacteria? Yes, it is. What things do the bacteria use the short-chain acids for? The short-chain fatty acids for? Well, they act as signal molecules. They can affect lipolysis, which is fat breakdown. Um, they're used as, again, the source of energy. We estimate that somewhere around 10% of the caloric requirements in humans is fulfilled by short-chain fatty acids. They can inhibit growth and proliferation of tumor cell lines, particularly butyrate. Butyrate and propionate are two of the short-chain fatty acids we know the most about. So they can inhibit uh, tumors from growing. They help to induce apoptosis, which is programmed cell death in the case of the human colorectal cancer cells. So when you have lots of short chain fatty acids, you get proper cell death. And when you don't, sometimes cells that are old don't die and they start to reproduce haphazardly and you end up with colon cancer. So high levels of short chain fatty acids are correlated with lower levels of colon cancer. And uh, there are lots of different functions, but we don't know all of them, but we do know that it's sort of this indirect measure of health. Where does energy come from for bacteria in the small intestine and do bacteria in the colon travel up into the small intestine? They, do they travel down to the colon, fuel up on short-chain fatty acids and travel back up? The answer is we don't know how all of that works, but I did include that article from the Journal of Lipid Research from September 2013 the role of short-chain fatty acids in the interplay between diet, gut, microbiota, and host energy metabolism for everything you could want to know about short-chain fatty acids and, um, and how they work. For more information there. And uh, I think with that, we're almost at 90 minutes. So I think I'm going to stop there.
And again, thank you so much for joining me on this call. I hope it was helpful. It's sometimes challenging to have a group where we have some people who are practitioners, PhDs, MDs, nurse practitioners, uh, registered dietitians, and so on. And then we have an audience of health coaches who are also very clinical, but maybe with less of a scientific background. And then we have some patients, some of whom have very sophisticated science backgrounds, but some less sophisticated. So it's hard to hit that perfect stride and uh, cover everything for everyone. So I apologize to anyone who felt left out, either on the patient side or on the practitioner side, if you felt it wasn't sophisticated enough. We really want your feedback. This is the first time we're doing this. We aim to please. So please let us know if your needs weren't met and perhaps next time we'll split the groups. Maybe that's something that we need to do. But we want to make sure that we're meeting your needs. If you have urgent questions that were not answered, send them to us. I want to give you as much information as I can. I want to really arm you with as many tools as I can to make sure that if you're suffering from SIBO, you have some answers and some possible solutions. If you're a practitioner, you feel like you're well armed with helping patients with their struggles. And again, I'm sorry if the message is a little pessimistic, but I'm really trying to, to um, make, keep it real, as they say. And this has been my experience as a gastroenterologist over the last several years, treating probably at this point thousands of patients with SIBO. And so I hope this was helpful, and I look forward to joining you next week.